September 1st. And Jack, you know what that means? Rosters expand, prospects get called up, and we've got a lot going on across the baseball landscape right now. It's the Just Baseball Show as we have the final stretch of the season coming up. You're getting ready for another season right now. And for those watching on YouTube, you can see kind of the Embassy Suites-esque background that you're sporting right now with the headphones recording as if you're you know, some celebrity kind of joining me on the show here. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, let me show you where I am for all you YouTube folk. I have no idea why portrait mode was on, but now as I switch it, uh, I am at Neyland Stadium. That's gorgeous, right? Well, so you're at we, the uh, stadium? There's like a hotel not, in the stadium? No, I'm, not, I'm oh. not at the stadium. So we are at an undisclosed Hilton. There are two in the Knoxville area. I'm not going to tell you which one we're at, though, uh, because, you know, like for some reason, that's a big deal in SEC football. Like a lot of the student body is is going to come and, you know, try and keep the quarterback awake at night. Like I think yeah, that's the big issue here. Um, any opposing team at Penn State, stays at the Ramada. So if you want to mess with a Big Ten quarterback that is going to Penn State, try and find him in the Ramada or in the Ramada that has no windows. So go right ahead. But yeah, Ball State football um opens up the season at Neyland Stadium tonight uh in Knoxville, Tennessee, expecting over a hundred thousand people, which will be really cool. That is insane. A hundred thousand people. And uh what are we expecting the score to be? Uh, well, Vegas says that Tennessee is going to win by 35 and a half. That's a pretty sizable spread there. Uh, we'll see uh, what happens. Tennessee, not only the best first quarter team in college football last year, but uh, Hendon Hooker, their quarterback, 31 touchdowns, three picks. So they oh, are okay. uh, they're a pretty solid offense. Their guy, Josh Heupel, was the um, – I think he was Scott Frost offensive coordinator at Central Florida. But we got to talk about a South Florida guy. Um in Shane McClanahan, I know in this episode as well. So you got UCF, USF. Uh, I will not bore you with any more football talk, but hence the shrubbery. I'm sitting in a hotel lobby. The last question on the football side. Is this one of those situations where Ball State gets like paid a bunch of money to come down and just get, get knocked around yes. by Tennessee? That's the sickest thing in the world. Yes. Uh, that you get paid to just get beat up. I, I, I want to put together a team like Bishop Sycamore style and just let yes. colleges pay to beat my team up. So... A, I don't think the Ball State Cardinals are going to get beat up, hence the Ball State quarter sure, sure. that I'm wearing right now, company man. Um, B, listen, man, I mean, this is like a bunch of college kids hopping on a charter flight to Knoxville and then getting a police escort to the stadium just to walk around and look and then get yeah. a police escort back to the hotel. It's awesome. great. This it's is awesome. a phenomenal experience for everybody. Yeah. Tennessee's obviously got the money throw it at another non or throw it at another group of five school. Why not? Absolutely. Love it. But we'll talk about Shane McClanahan because that's that he comes from USF, which yeah. baseball wise, they're, they're pretty darn good. Uh, but yeah. football wise, it would probably be a similar situation. I'm sure somebody's paying USF to beat them up uh, in, in the first week, but I'm sure McClanahan goes down with the shoulder impingement. I, I think that's honestly not the worst outcome. He gets the injection. He's supposed to, and expected to be uh, back by the time that his IL stint is over. It was a little alarming when you saw him warming up in the bullpen. I think a lot of people saw the, the video that circulated on Twitter of just, you know, him looking pretty upset, feeling his shoulder and saying, Oh no, this might be something bad. You know, impingement is kind of a broad term, but yeah. when they don't say it's a specific rotator cuff or a specific, you know, labral issue impingement seems to, I, that was something that I was diagnosed with like three times before I fully messed my shoulder up, but it seems to be just kind of a small flare up that you can manage if you catch early and you should be good to go. Seems like they may have caught it early. The injection hopefully helps and McClanahan should be able to finish the season strong and then, you know, kind of go back into the full fledged rehab and, and do whatever he needs to do in the off season. Yeah, so it, pretty much like the very definition of an impingement, of a shoulder impingement, is connective tissue. So that's likely like a tendon rubbing against the shoulder blade. So that's yeah. muscle on bone, and it doesn't feel good. Yeah. Um, McClanahan, he, here's the thing. So obviously we know it really well. Like when you read headlines, you take two or three words that are the buzz word from one quote that may mean the exact opposite thing. Like how many times have we seen – ESPN overreact on first take to three words from 500 words that Aaron Rodgers said during a yeah. press conference. Right. Yeah. So I, that's what I think what happened with the video. Um, the video that was circulating on Twitter was Shane McClanahan, like putting his head on the bullpen coach's shoulder and like 
looked like he was crying. So yeah. naturally you think labrum tear or something like season done career over. I watched another video from Valley sports, uh, Florida Valley sport. I don't know. It, it's the Rays telecast. I watched one from the Rays telecast and there was this whole process before that there were like, there was 60 to 90 seconds before that where McClanahan threw the ball. He turned to the bullpen coach, did something with his arm, but then got on the mound again, ready to yeah. throw another warm up pitch. Yeah. It was not like he felt something and then just started crying. That no, did not happen. It, it's funny. I had the, the same exact takeaway when I saw the, the longer video. It was more like this is a guy kind of feeling it out. And then uh, the emotion afterwards was just kind of just more dejection like, shoot, here we go. Like, damn, it wasn't I was like to start. It wasn't like I threw something and my arm exploded and I, I know it's over. It, it didn't yeah. seem like one of those, but that's how it kind of circulated on Twitter. I agree with that. Seems like this is good news given, you know, relative to what we were expecting or worried about or whatever. And, you know, even I think the, the Rays, just Kevin Cash described it as quote, the best yeah. case scenario. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's good news out of Tampa, relatively speaking. Unfortunately, they've been getting a lot of bad news as it pertains <laughs> to injuries. And, and Brandon Lau hits the IL again. This guy really, it's been a lost season for him. Uh, 61 games, it doesn't even feel like he's played that many. And it seems like he was just starting to get things going. Now hits the IL again. Not sure what the timeline is on Lau, uh, but it seems like 10-day injured list. So right triceps contusion. That's not really a big deal. Sounds like that's a fancy word for just like a bad bruise. So he yeah. should be back. It's just more annoying because he was just kind of getting it going again, seemed to finally get things you know, under, get his feet under him. And now he's back uh, on the IL. He should be back though in the next couple of weeks. It's also retroactive to three days ago. So he could be back in a week uh, at the very earliest, not the end of the world there as well. Do, do you know if he got hit with a pitch? In the I don't know, set? man. I, I, I'm assuming that's what it was or like, a, you know, a collision on a slot. I don't know. I, I honestly didn't see it. Yeah. Uh, but assuming, I mean, contusion is just not really that big of a deal. You it's, and I have had contusions in the last week. Contusion yes. is a fancy word for bruise yes. for those that don't know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but it sucks when you have to put two all-stars on the IL on the same day. It's really exactly. hard. But um, you will say it's probably – two of the better injuries you can have uh, it, because it really has been that depressing yeah. for the Rays. Their IL list is, is probably if all of those guys are healthy, Their could, IS it's, it's a team that finishes above 500. I was going to say it's like a 25 war IL list at this <laughs> yeah. point with what, what they've been able to compile reliever wise uh, position player wise. And then also just some of the starters that have missed time. We just recorded an episode yesterday, not only talking about, McClanahan and his potential uh, ability to to catch Justin Verlander in the Cy Young race. Yeah. But we also were talking about the Rays and how we're least worried about them. Their schedule is kind of soft and, and they look like they should be okay relative to some of the other teams. Uh, I mean, if these guys are on the IL, it looks a little scary now. It's just so funny how much can change from the time we literally hit publish on the podcast and go to hit record the very next day. Now, what I will say is, um, and I think you know this, as well as anybody, cortisone shots, awesome, mm -hmm. awesome. Like Shane McClanahan might be feeling like he's got a new lease on life and, and yeah. he might come back and just be guns blazing, go light the world on fire for his last five starts of the year. And then if they do sneak into the postseason, starting game one of a wild card series. Uh, exactly. And I think they'll manage him and it'll be interesting to see. But yeah, this is that part of the year where you want to make the push, but you also don't want to run your, your pitchers into the ground. And it's, it's ironic that you look at a lot of the guys across the game that have been shut down, Tony Gonsal and kind of getting co close to that 150 inning mark, Shane yeah. McClanahan getting close to that 150 inning mark Verlander right at that 150 inning mark. And these guys are starting to go down. Uh, yeah. So you try to manage the workload. You try to, you know, not run your guys into the ground, but also make that playoff push. And that's why I like the September call-ups though, too, because you're able to bring in some youth. You're able to maybe bring in a spot start like a Hunter Brown, who even if Verlander wasn't hurt, Hunter Brown could have been a guy that, you know, you plug in to start and you can skip a spot in the rotation, get a little bit of a break for some of your guys. And what's interesting about Brown is he's probably going to be doing a little bit of both in that Javier type role, start relief, yeah. whatever it is for the Astros. And he's probably going to be damn good at it. Well, what's really funny about that, before we jump into exactly who Hunter Brown is and what he can provide the Astros, who have the AL West all but locked up right now, um, I, I saw something once 
it was formally announced that Verlander was headed to the injured list with that calf issue. Um, the top comment was, so do the Astros have to go to a five-man rotation now? <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is yes. So it's not going to be a six-man rotation anymore. It's going to be five, just like the rest of you poor folk around baseball. So uh, suck it up. Be a common person. Can't sit in first class. Um, so you can't have a six-man rotation. But I think they're going to be just fine. I think Verlander is – um. It, the beauty of this situation for Houston, they have so much depth where if Justin Verlander and the medical staff of the Astros decide that he is better off coming back on September 10th, as opposed to September 8th, you know, like you can put him at the back of that rotation. So yeah. even if he's off the IL, you can buy him five more days. Um, I don't think there's much stress on Justin Verlander or the Houston Astros at all right now. And adding Hunter Brown to the fold increases that tenfold. A hundred percent. And, you know, what's interesting is it seemed like the Astros were kind of grooming Brown to really take this role on. He, he's been making plenty of starts this year, 14 starts where he was dynamite. But they also had him going in, in the bullpen or coming out of the bullpen a little bit as well. I think some of that was innings management because he's never really thrown many more than 100 innings. And I think the presumption is he's going to play some sort of a part in their postseason run, whether it's as a reliever or, you know, filling in as a multi-inning reliever. So he's gotten comfortable coming out of the pen and it's looked really good. He's got multiple pitches he can come at you with, but he's got two that will be big league bullpen ready, which is a fastball that sits at 96 and then a slider that sits in the low 90s. So those two pitches will be perfect in a bullpen, but he's already shown this year that he can make starts and be stretched out five, six innings and be solid that way because the curveball is a solid third pitch and he even will sprinkle in a change up a little bit. Uh, this is a great, great pitcher. One of the best that we've seen. And uh, I'm really excited to see what Hunter Brown's going to do. So I just threw a total curveball at you, and I probably sound different right now because I just switched the microphone to be the actual Mac computer. Uh, this is Cody Voga. Cody is the lead SID. What's your like exact title? Whatever it needs to be. Whatever it needs to be. He's the lead SID at Ball State. So what he was doing before this was he was the SID, the sports information director. Um, so he handled all the media stuff for Auburn basketball when they made that Final Four and national championship run. Went, yeah, went to, made it to the Final Four in 2019, and then uh, unfortunately fell a shot. Texas Tech. Uh, Vir Virginia won. Virginia. Yes. Virginia won that one. That was the Kyle Guy free throw game. Oh, so yeah. after that, Cody came to Ball State. The reason I asked Cody to just hop on and, and slap an earbud in is because Cody is the one Colorado Rockies fan I have ever met in my entire life. Oh, hell Look, yeah. Just north of Ames, Iowa. He's a Colorado Rockies fan. So I, I want him to try and tell us, why we should continue to watch the Rockies. Cause I don't think you and I need much selling. Right. Uh, no, no, I, I'm ready for Rocktober next year. Uh, one Rocktober more year off year. from Rocktober. Well, so, yeah, to be fair, Rocktober is really 12 months out of the year. And it's more of a state of being too, <laughs> instead of just one month. Um, it really ramps up though, obviously uh, in October, but yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, my wife's actually from Denver too. So it kind of worked out. How do you feel about out. Bill Schmidt? I just give him time. He just needs a little bit of time. All right. Um, hey, I was telling him how much you love Tovar. Oh, Ezekiel Tovar. He's top 20 prospect in baseball. What do you thought on Tolly if it just came up? Because obviously him and the rest of Rockies nation. So all four of the others um, are going to be very invested in what Michael Tolly is doing over the next month or so. Yeah, I'm excited. Another one of the September call-ups that I think is is really interesting. Switch hitter, big time power, really put it together in the second half this year. And I mean, to look at what he did in AAA, seven homers in 17 games when he got to Albuquerque. Well, guess what? Coors Field is just like Albuquerque. I think the power is going to continue to translate and he walks a lot. So I'm excited to see what Tully is going to do. Okay, so I, I needed him to hear some prospect uh, just blessing from from Arm Layton on the Rockies. So go do your football stuff. Hey, you got it. And listen, I, I listen to you guys all the time. I know you're all in on Tovar and 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 a few of the guys coming up. So we appreciate it. Of course, go Rockies, go Rockies. Rocktober, baby. Uh, this is a crazy episode already. So back to the yep. September call up situation here. Who do you want to start with? Maybe Gunner freaking Henderson. I know we to wrap up on Brown. I mean, he's going to be just another depth piece for them that, you know, can fill in in the reliever role as a starter. And he's going to be damn good for the Astros and kind of comes up at the perfect time for them. They also caught up Yaner Diaz, who I think is one of the more underrated prospects in baseball. 
Catcher was kind of the primary position he was listed as, but also plays first. It's really about the bat for him, and he's a great bat off the bench. But Gunnar Henderson gets promoted, and I really think this is a big-time Big time addition for the Orioles. I just wrote about this on just baseball.com. And what's really interesting about it is I almost am always going to be cynical about a prospect's ability to impact a big league team right away. Right. I mean, it's, there's a very, very small amount of prospects that are both talented and polished enough to be able to do that. Right. That's like Wander Franco last year. Uh, that's like J rod this year, who even started slow Adley this year, you know, who even started a little bit slow as well. I think Henderson, even if he's not playing to the best of his abilities, is going to be a huge upgrade for the Orioles right now. Because if you look at what they've got from second base, Jack, they have no team in baseball has had less production on all in all facets of the game than the Orioles from second base. That's Rugnan Odor and whoever else they've stuck there in games. Negative 0.6 F war is the worst in baseball. Odor has been a disaster in the second half and is a bad defender at the position. If Gunnar Henderson's even league average offensively, you're getting more speed, better defense, and just, I think, a little bit more of an injection of life into this Orioles team down the final stretch. Yeah, and I think you're getting a guy with defensive versatility too, which kind of came out of nowhere. Um, you know, at the beginning of the year, I think we were talking about a short staff that might not be talented enough defensively to stick at short. Now, what he has done this year, aside from lighting the world on fire with his bat, is develop into a solid third baseman, a solid enough shortstop, a solid second baseman, and the chance to play first base. Yeah. If you watched the call-up video that the Orioles put out of him getting called into the office in Norfolk, um, they were talking about you know what positions he was going to play for the rest of the week before they actually told him that he was going up to the bigs. They said, hey, you know, you're, you're going to play second base on Wednesday and Thursday, and they're going to move to first on Friday. And like, that is exactly what Gunnar Henderson can do. He yeah. can play all four positions on the infield right now, and you've got that bat. I want to go through, you know, some of like those offensive numbers that he's put together with Bowie and Norfolk, and I want to ask you what falls or what spikes. Yeah, fair. Yeah. Um. So he's hitting so far this year in 112 games, 65 of which in Norfolk, 47 in Bowie. So Norfolk being the Triple A, Bowie being the Double A, sitting 297. Yep. Is he a 300 hitter off the bat? If they shelter him from lefties, I think he can flirt with the high 200s. My concern is left on left at the big league level. Long term, I think he'll be okay left on left, but I, I think he'll get chewed up a little bit against left-handed pitching. So that's the concern. Is he going to walk a lot? Yes. 79 walks in 112 games. Yeah, he's going to walk. He doesn't chase. He doesn't whiff a ton. He's patient. He's got a good approach. He, he's going to walk, and that's, that's what's going to kind of help him right off the bat. 24 doubles, seven triples, 19 homers. Yep. Um, is the power going to be there to that extent? That The power, I think, doesn't miss a beat. I think it's it's the bat to ball. How, how seamlessly is that going to translate, especially left on left? And that was kind of what I dove into as well, because 34% K rate against lefties, obviously a much, much lower, almost 17% K rate against righties. So yeah. it, that's normal. He's 21 years old and playing in the upper levels and still finding a way to produce an OPS over 700 left on left because he can walk and he Damn. slugs still when yeah. he makes contact. But I mean, this is a guy that's really figured it out against righties, even against triple a pitching. And uh, when I look at what he's going to bring to them defensively and what he's going to bring speed wise, even if he's a two fifty hitter, that's OPSing seven fifty. That is a huge boost from what they've gotten from Rugnit Odor, who's been hitting a buck 80 in the second half. while I think is a negative six DRS uh, over, over the course of the season. He doesn't even have to do that much to to be a big impact for him. And I think he's going to get the majority of the reps at second, especially now that the Orioles signed Jesus Aguilar, who could alternate at first base with Ryan Mountcastle. Um, And I think he's going to be a nice little addition for them. Yeah. Aguilar. um, Yeah. Yeah. It'll be interesting. Like he was a cult favorite, right? Um, Real quick on Henderson, 22 for 25 in the stolen base department. Did you see that coming before this? No, no. I I so did anybody. I don't think so because the presumption of Henderson moving off of short was not as much about his abilities in terms of like his hands. He has a plus arm. It was more, this kid's going to keep getting heavier and bigger and he's just not going to move. Well, that just hasn't been the case. The glove looked great. He looked agile. His footwork was great at short and same thing in the field. 
he's closer to a plus runner than he is an average runner. So you're looking at a guy that's going to swipe bags, uh, maybe not quite at the same level, but 10 to 15 on a full season scale, maybe 20 on a full season scale as he continues to get more comfortable. Like these are all tools that maybe people were kind of expecting to, to tick back as he got bigger and they haven't. He's maintained his speed, kind of like we talked about with J-Rod. He got bigger, filled out, but he maintained his speed. If anything, he got faster. And it seemed like Gunnar Henderson has kind of been in that same boat of just being such a good athlete. This is exactly what the Orioles need, especially with the way their offense has stalled out over the last couple of weeks. And uh, he could be exactly that that injection of life that can help put this yeah. team over the top. Um, Aguilar can kind of help them put it over the top too. Aguilar was struggling this year, obviously like a 674 OPS in 113 games, but I don't think people really realize how good Jesus Aguilar was I and mean, how good he could be. I a hundred percent agree. I mean, especially with what the role is going to be for the Marlins. He was expected to be their one of their best hitters. That's a bit ridiculous, right? But last year you drove in 93 on a bad team. And I know people say like, oh, RBI's luck. For the most part, yes. But Aguilar has some of the best barrel control I've seen out of a big leaguer. And he puts the ball in play. He's just a very good situational hitter in a big spot. That's who I want up. Look at the numbers with two outs, runners in scoring, whatever you want to look at. Runner on third, less than two outs. That's what Aguilar does. And even on a what's been a bad season for him with the Marlins this year, 15 home runs and, you know, just being able to drive and runs 50 RBI, I think led the Marlins, which is crazy. Like that's yeah. something that you add to an Orioles team that again has been struggling offensively. And that's a platoon bat for you at this point. That's nice found money right there. It's amazing, dude. I mean, he's put together a nine year big league career and is per 162 right now, slashing 255, 326, 452. So he's got a career 780 OPS. 23 doubles, 24 homers, 85 driven in. That's a that's a run producer, and you need run producers whether RBIs matter or not. And on top of that, all of that is true. Great guy. Absolutely a great yeah, guy and a leader. Funny. Right? Funny, funny dude. Matt really Joyce. good guy. Everyone <laughs> loves him in the clubhouse. I told you, he told me I look like Francisco Cervelli, which was hilarious. And just, and just I, I, I agree. I think just, you do just look kept, like Francisco Just Cervelli. kept trolling me about that when I covered the Strasburg game. But like – beloved in the clubhouse and for a young team, I think Aguilar is going to be a great leader for them and it fills in a role offensively, but also fills in a role in the clubhouse. And I think he's a perfect fit. Um, and this Orioles team got better, it, it, which is crazy because we're way past the deadline. And now yeah. they add, you know, what, what I think is one of the most dynamic and exciting prospects in baseball, who is slated to be top five prospect for us in the update and still will be, he won't graduate by the update and, yeah. and then add, you know, probably the best uh, DFA bat we've seen in a little bit of time here with Jesus Aguilar. So I mean, the Orioles got better. And at three games back, as it seemed like they were just starting to lose steam, they've got one last, you know, shot to try to make one last push here. And, and I love that because, you know, we're all in on this Orioles bandwagon right now this year. Yeah, I am too. Um, you mentioned Gunnar Henderson is going to be a top five prospect in your update. Another guy who's going to be a top five prospect in your update is, is now played a couple of games at the big league level. Corbin Carroll. I didn't realize how fast he was. Yeah. I mean, it was 31 feet per second. Yeah. That's the thing, dude. I've continued to notice how the scouting grades on speed are just always. Blowing. I mean, J rod, they were so off. They called so J -Rod off. A 50 runner, right. That was yeah. the consensus across the industry. 50. How about, how about O'Neill? No one had a 60 on O'Neill was a 50 runner and he's yeah. what, a third. I mean, in terms of sprint speed, isn't he like 98th percentile or something? I think 99th. Yeah. There we and go. then how about, how about uh, Bobby Witt? Everyone had 60 Nobody on had Bobby it. Witt. He's an 80. He's an 80 runner. Are there a lot more 80 runners than I think we were anticipating? Like, do we need, well, to I guess it's all relative though. So it's like, I feel like you can only have X amount of 80s because like 80 is, is the, the top notch of the top notch. So, so who are, who are the 80 runners then? Um, CJ Abrams. Th that's what Corbin. you think, but look at, look at the like savant sprint speed on, on Abrams. Yeah, for some reason it's not as high, but like, I, okay. So maybe Abrams isn't an 80. Who are the 80 runners in major league baseball, right? Now? It's Bobby Witt. Yeah. Yeah. I, like Tim LaCastro when he's healthy. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know if he's Mondi, the same. Mondesi when he's healthy. Mondesi when he's healthy. All the guys that run too fast for their body and their bones fall apart. Like Is Trey Turner an 80 runner? Yeah, I would say so. That's But now it. we got to be looking at J-Rod, O'Neal, Carroll. It's hard. 
it's crazy. And so that's why like, I, I almost don't trust the run grades now anymore. Every time I see a guy go to, up to, to the big leagues, they end up putting up stupid sprint speeds. And I'm like, wait, okay. So here's the top sprint speeds, by the way, Bobby Wood Jr. 30.4 feet per second. Jose Siri, 30.3. Dude, Trey that's Turner, an runner. 30.3. Bubba Thompson, 30.3. Yeah. So I, I would say realistically, and then you have Mateo, O'Neill Cruz, and Winton Bernard. Um, Dude, those love guys are Winton probably Bernard all, getting reps. I would say anybody over 30 feet per second is an 80 runner. And you got 10 guys in that designation. The other are Jake McCarthy of the D-backs and yeah. Eli White of the Texas Rangers. Maybe even if, if you want to cut it down to the top five, if we want to really split hairs, then it's the guys that are 30.3 and above, which is just La Castro, Bubba Thompson, Trey Turner, Siri, and Bobby Witt Jr. Because 80 is really only supposed to be a couple guys. If you look at hit tool, we've only had two 80 grade hit tool guys really in the history of, of hit tool evaluation. And it was Wanda Franco and it was Vlad Guerrero Jr. Um, so it, it's really weird with the 2080 scale. I've always thought it would, the 2080 scale has a lot of flaws, uh, but speed might be one of the weirdest of them all because it seems like we just, we just keep getting them wrong. Yeah, I, every time we keep getting him wrong. Um, you mentioned Jose Siri. Jose Siri is absolutely absolutely an 80 runner. Uh, I just pulled up his Savant page. Um, here are the things that he registers in. Uh, he is 100th percentile in sprint speed, 98th percentile in outs above average, 96th percentile in outfielder jump, 77th percentile in max exit velocity. Now, if you looked at average exit velocity, it would be you know as, as blue as can possibly be because <laughs> yeah. he can't hit. But I'm telling you, man, Jose Siri is, is one of my favorite players ever, I think. If he Mark was early Jose Siri. If he was like a 35 hit tool guy, he probably he'd be, he'd be the MVP. <laughs> he'd be probably something <laughs> close to that. Uh, are there any other call ups I'm missing that, you know, could make somewhat of an impact? Michael Tolio, we mentioned as, as uh, we had our friend jump in here. Uh, is, there, is there really anybody else that, you know, what's interesting actually staying on the Orioles point? Um, I've been interested in G-Rod and, and what Grayson Rodriguez could potentially, you know, how they're going to handle him. And there was a quote, Camden is pretty close. Healthy G-Rod still eyeing 22 debut was the headline from MLB no. Pipeline. You're shaking your head no. No. No as in don't do it or no as in it's not a possibility. Has he started a rehab? Um, I believe he either just did or is supposed to on th today, today as people are listening Thursday. Today. Yeah. Dude, that would be incredible. So let's say he makes two rehab starts and looks good. Looks fully healthy. Why not have him go five innings for you on the, in the big leagues and build up there? What's the difference? Stress, I guess. I don't know. I guess like if he gets shelled or something, maybe he's like overthrowing. I, I don't know. Cause I, I don't see where he, like he, he is the best pitching prospect. I think I've, I can remember in, in like in, in my time of evaluating pitching prospects, which look, it hasn't been that long. So it doesn't who hold are, that much. Yeah. Weight. But who are the others? I mean, who are some of the best to come up over the last couple of years? I, I'd have to look at top prospects year after year, but if, if there's a guy that could come up and make, look here, here's my thing. I've always liked him more than Boz. I still continue to like him more than Boz. Whether both were injured, both are healthy, it doesn't matter. Shane Boz made an impact right away for the Rays and then even pitched a postseason game. Why couldn't Grayson Rodriguez do that with four above average to plus pitches and great command? Uh, I, I think if he's healthy and he's ready to go um, in terms of ability, why not see what he can do? I, I don't think he gets shelled. I, I don't really see how he gets shelled at the big league level unless he just really – doesn't feel a hundred percent right health wise or mechanics wise, which you wouldn't call yeah. him up if that were the case anyway. Yeah. I'm with you. Um, I'm also looking back at like previous top one hundreds and I mean, I'm looking at I, Forrest Whitley, Michael Kopech, Brent Honeywell, Mitch Keller, Dylan Cease, Mackenzie Gore. It hasn't been a good crop of pitching prospects lately. A lot and, of these guys are late pop-ups. And none of them have what G-Rod has. Like, yes, it's a lot injury, uh, but I look at the durability that kind of comes with a G-Rod. Six foot five, uh, big dude. Every single season his velo has increased as the year's gone on. Uh, he's been just a bulldog and he throws hard and he, there's not a lot of effort in the delivery. He's so I, if they give him a chance, sound. that that team is now all systems go. And yes. it could be scary. Yes. Um, it, it's hard to 
know with the naked eye like what is low stress but watching Grayson Rodriguez throw a baseball you can tell that it's low stress he Great. has close to perfect mechanics it's incredible to watch Grayson Rodriguez pitch and and the um, stuff is just outrageous so it's outrageous they call him up he's probably instantly their best pitcher yeah yeah I mean hasn't both strung together like five or six grades he has recently? but if I if I was playing a, a, a one game, game wild card I'm legit starting Grayson Rodriguez and that is just tells you how high I am on him, but also like just how ridiculous he is. If, if we, if he were healthy this whole time, he'd probably be the number one prospect in our update. Yes. Instead, yes. he's going to be like three. See, I would vote. Um, now I want the Baltimore Orioles to make the postseason and thrive in the postseason because obviously this Orioles bandwagon is so fun to be on. So I think the Orioles are more fun and better with Grayson Rodriguez on the team. Part of me would not be pissed if Grayson Rodriguez made his major league debut as the opening day starter for the Orioles next year. I think no. that would be hilarious. Yeah, I think that's one of the coolest things you could ever do. And, and you know what? There's a legitimate chance that it could happen, um, which is which is pretty awesome. Uh, some other call-ups, the Dodgers bring Miguel Vargas back up, which I like because he seems like, well, we saw him in a couple games look really good and really yeah. comfortable. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it was more of just uh, a situation where, the Dodgers Taylor just was didn't hurt. really need him that bad. Uh, yeah. I think this guy can really make another candidate to just kind of make that seamless transition. He has hit at every single stop for the Dodgers, uh, really dating all the way back to rookie ball days. Simple swing, a ton of contact, above average power, great approach, doesn't chase. And he's it's been more of the same for him this year. In, in AAA, 304, 404, 511 slash line as a 22-year-old. Perfect. If he gets consistent ABs, I, I really think at this point he could contribute more than Justin Turner does. Yes, but the problem is he's not going to get consistent ABs. Uh, and barring injury, I don't think there's a spot for him on the postseason roster. Do I agree with you that he's better than Justin Turner is right now? Yes, wholeheartedly. I absolutely agree with you. Um, but the Dodgers won't do it. We know that. And they will figure out a way to get Miguel Vargas on the field in 2023. But this year, with how good the Dodgers have been as currently constructed, I don't think they're going to bend over backwards trying to find an everyday role for Miguel Vargas. Much Which, like they didn't for James Outman, who is deserving of getting more and more opportunities. He just hit his second cycle in four games. Dude, his first one. Did we ever talk about that first one? I don't think so. He went five for five with two triples. Hit for the cycle. Two triples. Two and to complete the cycle... He had a walk-off three-run homer. That's the best game I've ever heard of in my life. I don't think there's a better game than that. I, didn't Cargo have like a, a big walk-off homer to complete the cycle too? That was Arenado. Didn't he have a grand slam, like a walk-off grand slam to complete Cargo the cycle? Did it. I thought it was Cargo. I thought I it was Arenado. I might be wrong. But regardless, like that is is ridiculously like road to the show kind of game you could ever have. Uh, and, and Outman's kind of come out of nowhere. They don't really need him either, but there's another example. James Outman could probably give you more production than what you're getting from Cody Bellinger right now, but obviously they're not going to do that either. Arenado. It was, it was Arenado. Arenado. It was Arenado. Good and he call. did it again this year. I had no idea that Arenado did it again this year, July 1st, apparently. Hit for the cycle again? Yeah, hit for the cycle. Just like not even cool anymore with Arenado? Just yeah. used to it. Sorry, uh, I was searching. I want to talk a little bit about the Diamondbacks' future because yes. they exercised their 2023 club option on Tori Lavulo, which yes. is is interesting because I think he's done a great job with them. I mean, the team is really, I think, overperformed in some ways. Uh, yes. They were supposed to be horrible this year, and they've been just kind of bad instead. Uh, yeah. But you know, they've just been playing good baseball all around, and and I think that this is a team that has made a huge leap from last year. And I think they're going to continue to do so. Uh, we talk about the young talent. Zach Gallen has been one of the best pitchers in baseball over the last month or so and has been great this season yet again. He looks like a bona fide ace for them. I think they're going to continue to piece together the rotation. We know how good the offense is. They don't trade Christian Walker. They don't trade Josh Rojas. They don't trade any of their guys aside from David Peralta, which was like you might as well at that point. Uh, you know, that's just more trimming fat. No offense to him. They keep the team mostly together and young reinforcements are coming. The guys that have been up there for a little bit continue to get better. And, you know, you're looking at an Alec Thomas, who's kind of ridden the ups and downs this year of a rookie season. And 
will probably be much more comfortable next year. You're getting Corbin Carroll a taste. You've had Walker break out. You've had, you know, Dalton Varsho really turn into a nice player. This team is really fun. If they can figure the pitching out and there's some prospects that continue to look like they're trending towards a 2023, you know, impact and could yes. be up and break yes. camp. You look at Brandon Fott, you look at Dre Jamison, you look at some other guys, all could make an impact next year. The D-backs are going to be everyone's favorite, like dark horse, sneaky pick. That's not going to be, it's going to be the trendy pick next year. I can already see it. You know how like there are 2K teams that are developed, like not the best team in basketball, but you look at the team and it's like, oh, that's a fun 2K team. Like what the Bulls did with the Rosen, Levine and Lonzo Ball, yeah. like, that was a 2K team. It's not like they're going to go win the NBA finals, but they're a fun team. If you hit the random button and you get the bulls, you can play with them in 2k. The diamondbacks are going to be a very fun 2k team next year. They're incredibly fun. They're incredibly talented. Alec Thomas, Corbin Carroll playing every day. Dalton Varsho is a chameleon in the best way. You love it. I am in love with the pitching prospects. And, you know, you, you mentioned Brandon Fott and Trey Jameson. I can't get over what Brandon Fott is doing in the minors right now for Arizona. He's in Reno right now, triple A level, but Fott is putting together just quality outing after quality outing. It is incredible what he's doing. Tell me like what the pitch profile from your eyes is for Fott, because I see a really overpowering fastball. It's an overpowering fastball, a couple above average breaking balls, and then a good changeup. And then also the command is great. So he mixes yeah, in three great. to four pitches with great command and a fastball that sets the bar. And, and that's what I love. When you have a guy that doesn't have the elite secondary, it's good secondary stuff, not elite. When you have the fastball that sets the bar, everything else plays up. The command's good. I would bet a lot of money on that guy being a number three starter uh, at yes. the very and, and the number four at the very yes. worst. So the D-backs have a much needed starting pitcher there that will be big league ready next year. I, I thought he might be one of the call-ups too, but they kind of have a, you know, the roster crunch with now Carroll up there as well. And yeah. Stone Garrett, who you know has earned himself the opportunity to try to, to pr- prove himself down this final month here. And I'm glad they gave him a chance. So uh, w- with Fott and, and his polish already, and, and the stuff I think will continue to tick up and he's pitching in a brutal environment, triple a PC. Oh, yeah. Right. I mean, like Terrible. to put up the numbers he is, is really impressive. Uh, I, I want to hit on a few more September call-ups, but I also want to talk about Jesse Chavez and him yes. coming over um, real quick though. Let me fly through the, the pitching prospect. Oh yeah. yeah go ahead. Could have. Yeah. Let me fly through the guys that could pitch for the Arizona diamondbacks in, uh, in 2023. So you got Fott, you've got Blake Walston, the 21 year old who's in double right now. Really good. Uh, Ryan Nelson, Dre Jamison. Um, who else you got? Slade Chacon or Slade. I don't even know. Chaconi. Chaconi. Slade Chaconi. I like uh, him. Tommy, Tommy Henry's already up. Bryce Jarvis is in double a right now. Duke guy who I know, you know, yeah. Uh, and Robert as well. All these guys could realistically pitch for the Arizona Diamondbacks in 2023. That's a surplus. Yep. And I, I bet they go out and sign somebody. I really think they'll yeah. go out and sign another veteran as well. And, you know, Mad Bum, like he's not great, but uh, he's like a serviceable five. You know, I want Jose Quintana in a Diamondbacks uniform. Oh, that'd be like, I'd like that. It'd be, like be kind of awesome, right? So Jesse Chavez gets claimed by the Braves. And for the fourth the, time, I think. The fourth time. And, and Brian Snicker was pumped about it because apparently he's a great clubhouse guy. And that's part of the reason why he's, you know, kind of kept his career afloat at this point. And, you know, he, he's been a bullpen arm still this year. Hey, you, he's been really bad in LA. I think that's why <laughs> LA kind of just, or Anaheim, I should say, but they, they let him go. Uh, but he was fine in Atlanta earlier this year, which was the ironic part of it. And now he kind of goes back to somewhere where he's comfortable and, and maybe could be a decent middle inning reliever there, but, but that's not really why I brought him up. I brought him up because I want to talk about his career uh, and yes. how many times this man has been swapped and some of the names that he has been swapped for uh, maybe players that debuted before some people that listen to this podcast were ever even born, uh, yes. including hit the first guy he was traded for. He was drafted in 2001, by the way, the yes. first time didn't sign, then was drafted in 2002 in the 42nd round in 2006. He was traded to the Pittsburgh pirates for Kip Wells. Kip Wells retired in 2012. So just, just for an example, that that guy retired a decade ago. He was later traded for Akinori Iwamura from the Rays. Oh, I love Iwamura. I loved Akinori Iwamura. He had won six seasons. That was in 2009. Later in 2009, he was traded for Rafael Soriano. Also really Uh funny. Another funny trade that he was part of 
with Gregor Blanco and Tim Collins in 2010. He was traded to the Kansas City Royals for Rick Ankiel and Kyle Dang. Farnsworth. Was this Rick Ankiel the outfielder or Rick Ankiel the pitcher? At that point, that was Rick Probably Ankiel an outfielder. the outfielder. Okay. Then, a couple years later, he's traded for Liam Hendricks. Traded to the okay. Toronto Blue Jays for Liam Hendricks. 2016, traded for Mike Bolsinger. Remember him? No, I don't actually. A few years later, traded to the Chicago Cubs for Tyler Thomas, a minor leaguer, and never, never made it to the big leagues. And then fast forward all the way to 2022, he was traded with cash to the Atlanta Braves for Sean Newcomb. This guy has been traded more than anybody, but he's also been traded for more funny, just like f- names you forgot about than anybody I've ever seen. And what an Dude. awesome just progression for this guy. And he's also been DFA in a waiver claim by a billion people too. I mean, it's, it's just fascinating. Like what this dude has done bouncing around, especially post COVID like 2021 and 2022, this guy is just like, you want him, you want him, you want him. It, it is distribution of Jesse Chavez's services. And you know what? I think he's happy to do it as a 42nd round pick. He got a ring last year. Uh, he gets a pitch in the world series and he's still going. Yeah, you know, hey, what a what a career for Jesse Chavez. Here's the thing about Jesse Chavez, though. I heard that he needs to buy a home every time he gets somewhere else. So he's got he's got a lot of money on the, on his books. Fourteen homes. He's got fourteen homes. Yeah, <laughs> I made that uh, up. He doesn't do that. He probably stays in the nearby courtyard. He probably doesn't even bother buying a home ever again. After, yeah, ever after, again. Ever after again. how many times he's been? He's gonna around. he's gonna enter retirement like six months in. He's gonna be like, damn, do I have to move now? Yeah, no, you're good. You can stay where you you're are, good. and you're no one's right. gonna send you anywhere, Jesse. You're, you're safe. okay, Jesse. I promise. So, but awesome career for him, relatively speaking, too, as as a 40 second round pick. But another guy that was recently traded gets promoted, Ken Waldachuk. And I've really been singing the praises for Ken Waldachuk and somebody that I, I really liked going into the season and we figured could pitch his way into being a trade chip, was traded for Frankie Montes. But Ken Waldachuk, very excited to see what he's going to do at the big league level. He's set to debut uh, in the next couple of days for Oakland. He's been spectacular this season, 95 innings between double and triple A, 137 punch outs, 36 walks, lefty, great stuff, really unique arm angle that makes it tough to pick up out of his hand. He's going to be a middle of the rotation starter for the A's for a long time. And he, he was a good piece for them to get. And I'm excited to see what he's going to look like in a very pitcher friendly environment in Oakland. Yes. And Yankee fans were really sad to see him walk. So it'll only make my heart happy if Ken Waldachuk shoves for the Oakland A's. And I think he will. I really think he will. And he has continued to just shove since the trade and uh, has pitched his way to that promotion. Are, are, are there any other call-ups? I know Blake Trinan's expected to return this week, which is a huge Huge get uh, for the Dodgers to bring him back. I looked, I was watching his last rehab start was sitting 97, 98 miles an hour. So he's fully back health wise. Uh, Not really sure if there's anything else in terms of uh, major promotions or anything super interesting. The Mariners did reinstate Evan White, which is pretty crazy. Doing for me. Yeah. No, Uh, the defensive first, first baseman doesn't do anything for you. It doesn't do anything for me. I'm sorry. Um, the only other thing that jumps out is Jack Flaherty. We're recording right before he makes another rehab appearance. Um, so he's starting again for Memphis. Like we'll see if St. Louis can get anything out of Jack Flaherty this year. But I watched him in, in could have been his last rehab appearance. It, it was just so hard to watch, man. I mean, the fastball was 91 to 92. It was flat. It was it was bad. So they they shut him down after that, and now he's he's finally back making another he's rehab back start. Again, we'll we'll see what that looks like. At what it's point do you kind of just call it a season for him and and try to just tough. get back next year? Because you're not going to trust this guy in the playoffs. You're not going to trust him down the stretch. So so no. what is he working back from? Maybe he is just going to pitch in the minor leagues the rest of the season. I've got no idea. And the hardest thing is like when I was when I was reading through what was going on with Flaherty before that rehab start. Um, it sounds like it was by his own volition that he ended his first rehab assignment. He was like, I'm good to go. I'm good to go. And he comes up and was just brutal. And obviously he was still hurt. So it, it's been a season from hell for him. So and here's I, to hoping that they can figure it out. And I feel for him because it's, it's this isn't new. You know, this has been a, a couple of years of, of recurring arm issues and shoulder issues for Jack Flaherty, which is concerning. One yeah. last topic I actually want to hit on before we call it a day here. There was a report from the Miami Herald, our, our friend Craig Mish, as well as uh, 
Barry Jackson. We talked about oh, the Marlins yeah. saying that basically they are prepared to trade from their surplus of arms this offseason. Well, they kicked the tires on it at the deadline, didn't get an offer that they truly wanted. Uh, for Pablo Lopez. He yeah, was for Pablo one. Lopez. It, you know, the, the, the offer that the Yankees uh, reportedly put forward, which was reported by Ken Rosenthal and corroborated by Mish, so you might as well take it as fact at that point. Uh, yeah. Glaber Torres and Oswaldo Peraza for both Pablo Lopez and Miguel Rojas. I, look, I, I would have been happy to get Peraza – you know, Glaber is a piece, but I don't really know where he would fit in for them. Maybe he plays third. Uh, I no, and he's got love... what one more year of arbitration, or maybe yeah. two more years of arbitration. Like, wouldn't have, I wouldn't, wouldn't have, have liked stayed. it. I wouldn't yeah. have liked it at all. So I, I, I think it was the right move by the Marlins to pass on that. But I, I was thinking about this because the Marlins apparently have two untouchables: Sandy Alcantara. Yeah. And did, did we talk about who the second untouchable was? Is it Jazz? A uh, pitcher wise. Oh, um, no, we didn't talk about who the second untouchable is. So do you know was. who the second untouchable pitcher is? Is it Meyer? Nope. Is it Cabrera? Nope. Is it Lozardo? Nope. Who is it? Eater? Nope. Yuri Perez is the second untouchable. Oh, that makes sense. That makes no, sense. but but at the yeah. same time, it, it's interesting. Like the fact that you just named three or four starters that reasonably speaking, you'd say, oh, okay, I could understand why they don't want to trade him. Like if they said Lizardo is untouchable, I'd be like, I get that. Rogers is struggling. You want your lefty that is lights out when healthy. If they said Edward, I'd be like, I get it. Yeah, I get it. I'd get it. If they said Meyer, I get it. Yeah. That's your top pick who is dominated through the minor leagues and is returning from Tommy John. You don't want to, you know, sell low. No, it's Yuri Perez. And we know he's a wonderkin and and he can be – just as good as Sandy if it all works out. But those are the two untouchables. So now I ask you, who from the aforementioned group are you parting with uh, to go get your bat? You know, who is the the pitcher that you would most reasonably want to part with while also acknowledging that you want to get as much of a return as you can get? Because obviously you'd be like, oh, just trade Jake Eater or, you know, just trade Meyer, just trade somebody else. But who do you want to part with to get the return that you also need? Because uh, the Marlins obviously need a, a big time bat. Yeah, Pablo Lopez. I agree. I think that's the and answer. I love I love Pablo. I really do. Yeah. But you know, I, I look at Pablo and and you know what what's the best that Pablo can give you? It's kind of what you're getting. Uh, I, I I also look at how the schedule for the rest of them lines up, and Pablo is just a couple of years before the rest of the guys really hitting full throat with their abilities. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like Sandy, if he continues to be the best pitcher on the planet then I understand, you know, like, like he will stay on Miami Marlins. If he is the best pitcher on earth, like they are going to drop a bag for Sandy Alcantara. That's how that works. Um, I, I think that he will continue to sustain that success for the rise of Edward Cabrera and Lozardo and Meyer working his way back and Eater working his way back. And like, I don't know. I just, I look at Pablo and I'm like, his timeline is just a little bit earlier than everybody else's. And all the other guys you're hoping if it all works out, will be potentially better than him. I mean, that's the hope, right? I mean, and and I know that's ambitious, but, and that's what you're hoping for because Lopez is really, you know, more of a number three starter, I think at this point. And he has flashes and stretches where he looks like a two, but he's more, more a number three starter, I think in, in a really good rotation. What um what was the report that I saw like last month? Do you remember who it was from where they said that they would listen to everybody not named Jazz Chisholm? It was everyone not named Sandy. I thought it was everyone not named Jazz. No, because then we were talking like, wait, does that mean they're willing to listen on Jazz? And I think the answer was obviously no. I think it kind of just went without being said. I, I don't know. I thought that was really weird because they said everybody oh, not named Sandy. And I saw was like, that one just... like two weeks ago, but before that, I saw everyone not named Jazz, and I was like, "Really? If you listen on Sandy, I don't remember where." Oh no! Nah. If they listened on Sandy, nobody would. Nobody would. I mean, there's not many left, but legit, whoever's <laughs> left would stop watching because I mean, they actually had a nice crowd of. I know it was a lot of Dodgers fans, but twenty five thousand, like we talked about before, showed up for it that Dodgers Marlins game with it Sandy on great. the bump. It was great. And Sandy had an incredible bounce back game. They're yeah. not that dumb. They're, they they have moments where I question things, but the no, Marlins I, I aren't trust that Kim. Dumb. I tr- trust Kim with that stuff. I trust. Yeah. I mean, and, and you know, I am very interested to see 
how they handle this off season, because I think they're going to make a big splash, but I wanted to pick your brain on which arms you'd trade. And Braxton Garrett's been no slouch either it, w- before hitting the IL. Yeah. Before hitting the IL 68 and two thirds innings, 13 starts. He punched out 71 and walked 17, three, okay. four or a three, six, seven ERA, a three, four, seven fifth. Okay. Exercise. You're ready. You're yeah. in the, you're in the chair. You're in like the therapy chair um, right next to me in this hotel lobby in Knoxville, Tennessee. You ready? Um, Arm, I want you to pick five pitchers you want on the team in 2023. You want in the organization in 2023. Everybody else is gone. Who are your five? Uh, assuming that, like, including the, the trade of Pablo, right? So, I like Pablo included. No, I want you for, right now. From Just the my top, my top the Miami Marlins organization, the five pitchers that you are not moving. I'm not moving. Uh, there's, if you're there's holding no, five of them. I, there's no way I'm moving Sandy. One. There's n- no way I'm moving Yuri. Um, Two. It, it sounds funny, but I'm not moving Trevor Rogers because I think it would be a, a, a ridiculous sell well. And Three. I think he can be way better. I think he can be really good still. Okay. I'm okay with trading Meyer. I, I really am. And I, I am not fully opposed to trading Edward Cabrera. Oh I wouldn't God. trade Lizardo. Four. I guess Edward would be my five, but like I, I'm willing to deal him. Dude, here's my problem. Do you hate the Marlins? <laughs> yes, yes. But here's my problem with it. Edward Cabrera just... and Lazardo are the same thing. Guys that, when they are healthy, have some of the best stuff in the bigs. They fight some command issues from time to time, but their biggest battle is health. And you have two carbon copy health concerns that it's shoulder, too, for both those guys. I, I, I'm willing to just get rid of one of the shoulder guys. And, and I'm not trading Lazardo because you need a lefty. I also love Jesus. Uh, but you need a lefty especially if Rogers is struggling. I, that's the one guy that I'd be a little bit more willing would be to trade Edward, even though I freaking love him. But I mean, he, the guy's been hurt every year. Interesting. Okay. See, I'm doing um, Sixto Sanchez. Uh, who else <laughs> is around? Victor. They Victor just, Mesa. Shut, they just turn... shut Sixto back down. They shut Sixto back down. I yeah. heard he was up to 104 feet. No, no, no. He never got up there. Oh, wait, no, he got up to like 82 miles an hour, right? Yes, they were doing mile per hour. That's how they were measuring it, not feet. It was like, oh, Sixto was up to 80 miles an hour. I was like, great, he can pitch in high school. And, and, and like, that would be like below and average have in Florida a high school. Five ERA. Yeah, yeah like, what, why are we measuring by, by VLO? But anyway, that's enough Marlins talk. Before we wrap up, <laughs> anything else? Because that's the most Marlins airtime I think we've given them in a while. But I thought the pitching conversation is interesting because there's a lot of teams that are going to be interesting matches. And I look at like the, the blue Jays. Why not trade Gabriel Moreno at this point? Yeah. Trade Moreno. What? He's not even doing anything for you. Like trade him. Uh, but you know, it'll be interesting to see how that all goes down. Any other final topics, thoughts, anything going on in the baseball world before we call it a day? I don't think so. Happy college footballing to all who observe sec network, seven o'clock Eastern. You got ball state in Tennessee. Yeah. I'm sure that'll be a really close game down to the final you know, possession. Eat shit. I will. I will. And that'll do it for today's episode of the Just Baseball Show. Happy September. Check out all the links below. Check out JustBaseball.com. We are churning out a ton of content, specifically centered around what you can expect on a lot of the September call-ups. Jack dropping the, what is it, the power rankings today as well? Are those uh, out today? Today. today. Yep, Let's go. Today. So power rankings coming out today as well. Check those out and then go yell at Jack for where he ranked your team. The three of us will talk to you tomorrow.